Um, thank you. Good afternoon. So yes, my name is Rupa. I feel like I got to meet a lot of you. Um, I'm a pediatrician by training, and I do have some experience um, with clinical management of severe acute malnutrition and then um, cholera outbreak response. And um, just to give you background, so this is actually going to be kind of a quick and dirty review of some of the previous data and also new studies, um, especially looking at IV rehydration and severe acute malnutrition patients, mainly with cholera and diarrhea. Um, it's part of a larger scoping review that um, I'm working on with UNICEF uh, that will be a bit more uh, comprehensive. So. Some of the objectives um, is just to review just a bit of the basic pathophysiology and some of the challenges in managing um, some of these children, severe acute malnutrition or SAM, um, especially with cholera. Reviewing our current guidance that we have and also the previous literature and rationale behind um, some of this previous guidance. Uh, summarizing some of the new literature uh, that has recently come out um, in children with SAM in particular looking at cardiac function, and then also IV rehydration, and then also discussing the possible challenges um, in the current practices based on some of the literature and maybe some of the next steps that we can consider. How many of you have ever managed a severe acute malnutrition patient clinically? Good, a lot of us. So the big thing, you, you all know how fragile these children are. And so um, I think one of the big points, um, obviously, to try to discuss and see is really balancing the safety of managing these ch children, but also not under-resuscitating them, especially when they present to us in shock, which can be very common when they do have these diarrheal losses. So... Um, just to give a little bit of background, um, I know we discussed, I know our surveillance team went through a lot of these things, but in 2022, we had over 30 countries that were worldwide um, that were uh, reporting cholera, and over 80%, 85% of those countries um, actually were also uh, reporting severe acute malnutrition at the time. So lots of um, issues with both food insecurity, cholera, and you can imagine um, complications with these patients that also would have SAM. Um, patients with SAM that present with severe purging and hypovolemic shock, obviously they are at high risk of electrolyte deficits and shifts, and also death if they're not rehydrated and identified immediately. And as most of you know, if you've worked in a cholera treatment center, these patients, all the patients that have cholera usually are going to a cholera treatment center. They're not going to some specialized feeding center or something of that sort. Initially, they're all usually coming through a cholera treatment center. So that's why identification and triaging them is very important. And then again, just to reiterate, one of the most important issues is really making sure we stabilize these severely and dehydrated and shocked patients with IV rehydration. And then once they are stabilized, getting them to the specialized care, whether it's a therapeutic feeding center and so on. So some of the complications um, that we can see with patients with severe acute malnutrition with their pathophysiology, um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, and we'll get into this um, in a little bit, there has been previous thought that these children have decreased cardiac output um, and also stroke volume. Um, they, we definitely have seen and know that these children are at much higher risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, they're also at higher risk of hypothermia and definitely lots of metabolic derangements. In particular, hypernatremia, uh, it's thought that they have a higher level of intracellular sodium and hypokalemia. Um, the belief is that a lot of this, the potassium that's intracellular actually moves to the extracellular space. And again, these kids are all at a higher risk of infection and sepsis. And also, they are um, a little bit more difficult to actually assess for levels of dehydration because of lack of skin glands, I'm uh, sorry, looser skin and lack of some of the uh, glandular tissue and things, especially for uh, providers that haven't managed these children in the past. So again, uh, we're going to get to a little bit talking about the cardiovascular thoughts and some of the previous data that was about this. So previous literature, um, there has been about, what I could find at least about 20 studies 
dating all the way back from 1946 um, and then up to about 2016, and we'll get to the new studies later. And in those 20 studies, um, there are several different ways they looked at these children um, with heart function. Sometimes they looked at EKGs, sometimes they looked at Doppler, sometimes they looked at um, echocardiogram, sometimes they were doing necrolepsies or um, aut autopsies in these children to actually look at the heart muscle under microscopes. So some of the studies, it was a divided, divided um, types of review looking at these older studies. Some of them did find impaired heart function, but they thought that was actually in proportion to the total body, body surface area and also the metabolic demand of these children because they have a lower metabolic demand. Other studies out of these about 20 showed that there was decreased heart function um, in these patients, but it was disproportional to their body surface area and metabolic needs, and they actually thought maybe there was a decreased level of function. So now getting to a bit with, that's a little bit of the background. Um, when we come back and we're gonna get to our GTFCC cholera guidance, especially for the IV severe rehydration and, sorry, severe dehydration um, protocol and also shock. And so at the time um, when these guidelines were made, you know, again, kind of what we just presented, there's limited and very conflicting data regarding actual cardiac function and IV fluid administration and safety. So guidance was developed based on that available data at the time, in addition to expert opinions. So the current guidelines. So these are the current GTFCC guidelines. Um, and this is for rehydration, IV rehydration for patients with severe dehydration with severe acute malnutrition and cholera, in addition to if they have shock as well. So for on, you can see in the table, so on the left, sorry, on your, on my left, um, for the severe acute malnutrition patients, the guidance is to give 15 milliliters per kilogram of IV fluids uh, listed below over one hour. If that improves, then there's the, the re recommendation of repeating 15 milliliters per kilogram over the next hour. So the recommended IV fluids are listed there. They're all dextrose containing with some type of an isotonic solution. So for non-SAM patients that have cholera, uh, this is actually similar to the same as WHO guidelines. So 30 mLs per kilo of ringer lactate over an hour, then 70 mLs per kilo over five hours if they're under one year. So total is um, 100 over six hours. And then if they're over a year, it's 30 milliliters per kilogram of ringer in 30 minutes, and then 70 over 2.5 hours. So pretty much with the non-SAM patients, it's a matter, it's a total amount of fluid if they present in severe acute, um, se severe dehydration, but it's a difference in just over how much time that you're giving that fluid. So just to compare some of the other guidelines. So one of the other published guidelines, um, an MSF guideline of managing cholera outbreaks. Uh, this was, I believe, it was published in 2017, I think updated in 2018. So for severe acute malnutrition for um, MSF, they are recommending 20 milliliters per kilogram of ringer lactate over 30 minutes. And then if danger signs are still present, you can repeat the bolus up to two more times and then giving 70 mLs per kilo of ringer over six hours um, is the second part. For the non-SAM, you can see it's a pretty um, similar uh, type of picture. It's just basically giving the fluid a little bit quicker, but pretty much the same amounts. And so now we're gonna go to some of the new literature. So looking at heart function in SAM, so I was telling you the previous <clears throat> guidelines and things, that was including studies up to about 2016. So there have been two new studies um, that have come out that have looked at heart function in children with severe acute malnutrition. And they're challenging actually this previous belief that cardiac dysfunction um, is present in some of these children with severe acute malnutrition, both baseline and also with rehydration. So these two studies, um, one is called the AFRM study um, from 2017, and the other one is called the CAPMOL study. And these, both of these studies are actually, um, have, they took place in East Africa. So for the AFRM study, this was um, assessing cardiac response to IV fluid and rehydration utilizing ECHO um, in children with 
severe acute malnutrition, and hypovolemic shock from gastroenteritis before and after rehydration. The maximum amount of IV fluid these children received was two boluses of ringer lactate at 15 mLs per kilo per hour. And the findings were actually, again, based on the echocardiograms and clinical exam was no compromised cardiac function or signs of fluid overload, both at baseline and also following IV hydration. And then the cat mall study, this one similarly did look also at uh, cardiac function. Same children with severe acute malnutrition um, following IV rehydration, these children also were presenting with severe dehydration and shock. And they were using, they utilized echocardiogram and also EKGs. So um, for this one, they received up to 20 mLs per kilo per hour of IV ringer lactate. This could be repeated up to two times. And these overall fun findings showed no significant cardiac dysfunction, fluid overload, or fatal arrhythmias um, that they observed. So we'll get to the actual uh, severe acute malnutrition and cholera study, but uh, that data has been very limited. So what, um, what we did do, decide to do was actually look at rehydration, again, IV rehydration for this discussion today in children with severe acute malnutrition and gastroenteritis. So because of, again, these limited studies with cholera and rehydration in this population. So there was a, um, a systemic review that was done by Houston et al. Um, that was done in 2018. And that was used as a starting point uh, to look at studies. So they had identified four studies. Then I looked at literature that was published since that time to currently, again, to look mainly at children with severe acute malnutrition um, di diarrheal disease, and then significant dehydration. So there were five studies total that met that criteria. Those studies, again, two of them took place in East Africa, and actually three of them took place um, at, uh, in Bangladesh. And from those five studies, and from this recent, we looked and we found that there was no evidence of fluid overload or actually other fluid-related adverse effects when they were looking at children, even on some of the more liberal rehydration protocols with IV rehydration. Again, after the screening and analysis, this is uh, why I wanted to save this uh, till the end. So there was only one study, actually, that we could find um, to look at IV rehydration and in severe acute malnutrition and cholera. And this was a study that took place at ICD-DRB. Um, basically, they were looking at, they were assessing the safety of rapid IV rehydration of SAM patients and also comparing three different ORS solutions. So the results, um, so 85% of the 149 patients presented with severe dehydration requiring IV rehydration. They received just over 100 mLs per kilo of IV fluid over six hours. Um, and then speaking to actually the primary author, when I asked how they broke that up, he said a lot of the times they were giving 30 mLs per kilo over the first 30 minutes of an isotonic solution, and then 70 milliliters per kilogram over the next five and a half hours. So all patients um, that were in this study were successfully hydrated uh, after six hours. No patients developed any notable electrolyte derangements. No patients died, and also no patients developed any uh, signs of heart failure or fluid overload. So potential next steps. Um, this is, I think, it's interesting looking at a lot of the data. I've seen a lot of the data come from similar areas and parts of either Africa or Asia. And I think this is a really good time and network for us to probably discuss how we could maybe collaborate and do something as far as more of a multi-center trial or working together and sharing data to try to move forward just with seeing how limited this data is and how vulnerable this population is to really answer some more of these questions. Um, I think creating some algorithms and making sure we can simplify some of the case management in these SAM patients with cholera, especially for providers, again, that have never actually managed severe acute malnutrition, even to just manage 
a moderate acute malnutrition child with malaria is intensely difficult. So trying to really streamline and uh, simplify some of the management so that it's easier for some of the people managing them can do that. And then also, this was a discussion and we talked a lot about surveillance, but um, for me, I do think it's important to have severe acute malnutrition on a line list or at least identified for sure on a patient's chart. As far as in, including in surveillance, I think that can be dependent on countries and other things, but for the actual clinical management, absolutely, because as you can see, management is very different for these children. Um, and so just even doing MUAX um, in these patients, when any patient under five, I think it's important if they're coming into a cholera treatment center, uh, making sure you do a MUAC and following that. And then also, we also discussed about data and sharing and all of us doing our best to try to improve surveillance. But that's the difficult part, looking at a lot of the information, trying to really see what the incidence of patients uh, that are admitted with cholera and severe acute malnutrition has been very challenging. Um, and again, I don't think it's a lot of the, um, it's not a common thing collected on line lists, but I think that's another important thing to, to discuss. Um, I want to thank you all for your attention, um, and then also obviously thank everyone at GTFCC, and then uh, my colleagues at UNICEF who've been very helpful, uh, Ben Allen and Megan Gayford, and then also uh, Kate, Kiralee, and, and Isa as well. So thank you. <laughs>